blessed by this country to, um, to have had a chance to do some pretty interesting things in my lifetime. Uh, you know, I was in the, with the Navy for 23 years. First half of it, I got to fly F-14s, which was a pretty cool job. Second half, I, I got to spend with NASA as, as a NASA astronaut. And, uh, and then after that, went to a very small services company um, called Ares Corporation because uh, I realized that although uh, I had a nice resume, I didn't have any profit and loss experience, no experience in, in the real world, as we say, in the military. So I uh, went to a small company, learned profit and loss, and learned how businesses work and, and finance, and then, uh, and then came to Raytheon about three years ago. And I've been in this position for about three years. So uh, if you have any questions about Raytheon, what I've done, what we do, how you fit into it, uh, I'd love to take them now. Oh, spacewalks are cool. I, I tell you what, it's, uh, there's only two things I miss about uh, working for NASA. I miss doing spacewalks and I miss the people, you know. Um, and so uh, doing a spacewalk is pretty awesome. You, you live on an absolutely gorgeous planet. You really do. It's, um, and uh, when you're off the planet, you miss it a lot. But the perspective you get of it, you know, it is so different. You know, you, things that you think of as local phenomena there, here, you realize are much larger, part of a much larger picture there. Uh, I've seen lightning uh, ripple down a front that was 300 miles long, starts at one end and ripples down the whole thing. Seen sandstorms over the Sahara that are 100 miles wide. Seen uh, hurricanes that are so big, you know, that when we can, we can see about 500 miles from horizon to horizon, and the hurricane fills the entire Earth, part of the Earth you can see. So uh, Mother Nature is wonderful. Uh, the view is incredible. And uh, I tell people all the time, I just wish I could take all my friends <laughs> when I went, because it's, it's that cool of an experience. It really is. It really is. I was an F-14 Rio, yes. Yep. They did, yeah. I'm actually, I graduated from Top Gun back in 1987, just shortly after the movie was out, which was, was good and bad. It was good because, uh, you know, it brought a lot of attention to what we do and how we do it. It was bad because the officers club was crazy on Wednesday nights, <laughs> so, uh, with people coming in. So uh, it, was, uh, it, was, um, it, was, it was a good experience, though, I'll tell you. Tomcats, uh, I, I, I tell people all the time, it's the only vehicle I've ever been in that I have an emotional attachment to. I, I have, uh, I, um, I loved flying Tomcats. Uh, being, being an astronaut, flying space shuttles was cool, but I loved flying Tomcats. <laughs> I really did. I really did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And some parts of it are actually somewhat realistic, which is good. <laughs> so. Uh, I flew three space shuttle missions. My first mission was in 1997. It was a science mission. Uh, we did all sorts of types of research, colon cancer research, combustion research, a lot of earth science. Um, my second mission was in 2001, STS-98. I did uh, four, three spacewalks on that flight to attach the United States Laboratory to the International Space Station. And my last mission was in 2006. It was STS-116. And in that one, I went back to the International Space Station to rewire all the electrical outside and also to, well, I didn't have a plan to fix a solar array. We had a solar array that, that broke, and, and so I went out for a fourth spacewalk and fixed it. So. How's the view outside of the spacecraft? How's the view outside of the spacecraft? Incredible. It's, um, it's very, very, it's awesome from the inside because you can see a very good, the windows aren't huge, but they're about this big, and you can see a good portion of it. When you're outside now, you get all of the peripheral view, and it is, I mean, gorgeous. They, I always tell people the earth is beautiful from there, but the thing that was the most stunning was the aurora. Uh, I, uh, my first flight, we were flying through the aurora australis, because it was that time of year, and we had a very high inclination flight going down south over, the, over Antarctica. So I uh, flew through, and it's like flying through a curtain of light. And because it's moving, it's undulating, it's got probably all the colors of the rainbow in it because of the electromagnetic interference that you would expect. 
And then on my last two flights, because of the time we flew, um, we, didn't, we didn't fly high enough uh, inclination-wise, but we flew um, so that you could see the Aurora Borealis then. And that was beautiful. And I was actually outside during a couple spacewalks where you could see the aurora very clearly. And it's, it's just an incredible light show. Incredible. Better than any fireworks you've ever seen, put it that way. So, yeah. Did you have to do a spacewalk on each one of the missions, or was it just that last one? The uh, question was about when I did my spacewalks. I did spacewalks on my last two flights. My first flight, I was, uh, we, only, we didn't have any work that needed to be done outside. It was before space station. And uh, so in that case, no, we didn't do any spacewalks, but I was um, the contingency spacewalk leader. So if something had broken on the spacecraft, I would have gone out and fixed it. Uh, but on the last two missions, it was, they were specifically to build, help build space station. So those were, six of those seven spacewalks were planned. So yeah, so I just did them on the last two flights. Yeah. Um, question was a trip to space and how long it takes. Not very long. It's amazing. You're, you're sitting at a standstill on the pad and uh, um, ascent or what we call going uphill is an incredible experience because it's all over in eight and a half minutes. You know, you're sitting from a standstill to 17,500 miles an hour in eight and a half minutes. And what we do is, uh, is just to describe how it works is the first thing we do is we get altitude. So we take off out of Florida and we're mostly climbing at first. And we get up to about 60 miles of altitude. And we're, at that point, we're six minutes into the flight. And we're only doing about 10,000 miles an hour. But then what we do is we flip over onto our back and then we roll over. And now we're parallel to the Earth's surface. And all we're doing is accelerating to gain orbital velocity. So you go from, like I said, zero to 10,000 miles an hour in about six, six and a half minutes. And then the last two minutes, you go from 10,000 miles an hour to 17,500 miles an hour. And I'll tell you what, it literally takes your breath away. You have to think to breathe because it pushes you so hard back into the seat that it, it kind of compresses your lungs a little bit. And I, I tell a funny story about that. My first flight, um, we're right around minute seven plus 45. So we've got about 45 more seconds to, uh, to, until main engine cutoff. Um, and uh, I'm sitting there and I'm like, my lungs are burning. Well, no one told me that my lungs were going to hurt this much, you know, because this is only three Gs. This isn't that bad. And then I realized I hadn't taken a breath for about 45 seconds. So, so, so uh, it's, uh, so dear boy, it, it, it's pretty, it's a pretty awesome feeling because you, you come off the pad, it feels like you've been rear-ended by an 18-wheeler. It just keeps on pushing for eight and a half minutes. And then it stops and then everything just starts floating. And then you're going so fast that you start at 60, mile, 60 miles up and you coast all the way up to your orbital altitude of sometimes in excess of 200, mile, 200 miles. So uh, it's, it's a pretty impressive ride. If, uh, I highly recommend it. <laughs> I highly recommend it. So. Yeah. Question was entry. Entry is so smooth. The only thing that makes it challenging is because is that you haven't been in gravity for a while. So it's only about a G and a half at peak set, and usually it's not that. And what we do when we're coming in is we do a series of uh, what we call S turns. And what you do, you're sitting, you're coming in at 40 degrees angle of attack. So you're actually, if the shuttle's like this, you're actually flying down like this. And, um, and what you're doing is you're just yawing the nose one way or another so that you can kind of S turn your way back into the atmosphere to bleed off energy. And uh, you do this um, basically, like I said, you're doing 17,500 miles an hour. You decelerate to 17,200 miles an hour over the Indian Ocean, and that puts you back on the ground in Florida. You know, so it doesn't take much. It's very, very tenuous staying in orbit. But it, you know, you just feel the lazy turns. And uh, if it weren't for the orange glow coming in the um, the uh, the cockpit and through the windows because of the intense heat it's like it's maybe 70 degrees inside but outside it's about 2,000 degrees 2,500 degrees so so uh, you see a lot of, like I said the orange glow is pretty bright if it wasn't for that you wouldn't even know anything was happening it's so calm entry's very calm 
No, you can't see the tiles. What you see is, because you're going so fast, um, the upper atmosphere actually uh, goes from you know, a molecular structure to a plasma, and that releases a lot of energy, light and heat. So, and it just happens to glow orange. I've never done really the, the chemistry on why it's orange, but it is. And if you look up through the window behind you, you can see the vortex of plasma behind you, and it is very bright, and it's very hot, and it looks like it's about, you know, I don't know, probably a foot in, uh, in diameter, but, um, but it's behind you, and it's causing, it's creating a whole lot of light and heat, and you can see that. But like I said, it's really comfortable inside the cockpit, you know, and uh, other than that light, you wouldn't know anything was going on. Don't be shy, you know. I, I, you know, it's funny to me. You, you got, you've got basically uh, two groups. You got uh, three groups, really. You got the little kids who want to know how fast it is, how it fell, what were you thinking, you know. And that's usually till they get to about ninth grade. And then you got the high schools and college kids that I talk to, and they're always like, "How much money do you make? You know, <laughs> um, you know, how? What are your working hours? Do you get a lot of time off?" Um, do you go to get to go to interesting places? And then once people hit around 30 or 35, then it's like, how fast did it go? How did it feel? You know, so they almost revert back to, <laughs> to, to you know, the more the more emotional side of flying rather than uh, the uh, the the um, you know practical side of the business. So it's kind of interesting. It's always interesting talking to talking to the different groups and noticing they fall into those. Uh, pretty distinct category. Because none of you guys have asked me anything about the business side of it, but, <laughs> which I'm okay with. <laughs> I'm okay with that, but, uh, but feel free if you'd like. And what do you eat? <laughs> Question about food. Food's actually not bad. The problem is um, the way, you, flying in space, zero gravity affects your body in a lot of different ways. Um, a lot of them you've heard about. One that you may not have heard about is it, it, it actually um, dulls your taste buds. And nobody can figure out why. Uh, I mean, you know, they've been trying to figure out. They don't know why. So uh, the food is good, um, but you tend to like a lot spicier foods in space. And I like spicy foods here, so you can imagine what I'm eating up there. But um, uh, we've got three kinds of food, fresh, thermostabilized, and dehydrated. Dehydrated, you know, you, you get it. You know, you add water to it. You squish it around until the water gets through the whole thing. And then you either throw it in the oven to heat it up or not. Things that are dehydrated are like uh, macaroni and cheese, uh, scrambled eggs, pork sausage, things like that. And then we have fresh food. Um, that's always a problem because it doesn't, yeah, fresh food doesn't stay fresh very long up there because we don't have refrigerators or anything like that. So fresh food would be things like oranges, tortillas. We use tortillas because they don't present, they don't produce a whole lot of crumbs. Whereas regular bread, I mean, you know, they'd be flying all over the place. You don't want that. So we do a lot of tortillas. Um, uh, let's see, what else do we bring that's fresh? Nuts, M&Ms, things like that. It's all considered fresh food. And then you have what's called... You can get either. I'm a flour tortilla guy. <laughs> so, and usually, most of them are flour tortillas. When I was flying shuttle, it was all flour, unless you requested corn. So... And then, uh, last but not least, you got thermostabilized food. And have any, any of you guys eaten MREs, Meals Ready to Eat? Any of you former military? Well, we used to make, we used to design a lot of the MREs. And what it is is basically you put it in a, a juice bag, basically a juice pack bag, and you irradiate it to kill any bacteria in it. And then it stays pretty good for a long time. So things like that would be uh, seafood gumbo, um, ravioli, um, tortellini, things like, oh, no, no, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good. But the problem is, because your taste buds have dulled, you need it to be spicier. So almost everything, including my eggs, I either put um, um, Texas peat on, or I'll put uh, jalapenos in it, things like that, to spice it up a little bit so I can actually taste it. And, uh, and your taste buds change, too. So things you like here, you won't necessarily like there. So you've got to get a wide variety of food when you order your food to make sure you'll eat something. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example. I, I, I love applesauce for breakfast. I really, really like it. And uh, so I ordered one for every breakfast on my first space flight. 
and the first day I found out that in space I hate applesauce. I don't know what it is. It just does not taste right. So, you know, it just kind of stayed there and hopefully somebody else likes it and they can have mine because I was not getting near it. <laughs> so uh, that's the big challenge with food in space. If you're in space and there's no gravity, mm -hmm. if you keep your orange, it explodes. Yes, it does. You got to keep track of your stuff. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, the thing is you eat using um, a spoon and a pair of scissors. Scissors to open the pack, a spoon to eat it. And as long as the food is wet, it kind of stays together because, uh, because of the uh, uh, coefficient of cohesion in water. So the food will stay together. If, so you don't need a fork, you just need a spoon. And we, that's all we would do. We'd, do uh, we'd cut it open and we'd eat everything with a spoon. Everything from steak to down to eggs to frozen strawberries. Well, not frozen, dehydrated strawberries, everything. Does free fall extend the shelf life of, of fresh products? No, no. And that, that was, that was the, the toughest thing. If you had some kind of food that you really, really wanted, you found it like, and it was one of the fresh foods, unless it was something like M&Ms or something with a lot of preservatives in it, it wasn't gonna last very long. And we had one guy on my first flight who liked bananas. So he had like, I don't know, like two bunches of bananas. And we're in, after about day three, we're like, that's all in the trash because it was smelling up the place. And, and, you know, we got seven people living in this area, you know, not much larger than a walk-in closet for two weeks. You know, odor 